All right, so we are going back now to the set of notes that comes out of the Claire Bout's PVI book, the Processing versus Inversion book. And what I'm starting with here is a little section uh, on uh, univariate uh, uh, estimation. And from the old format of the class, this, uh, this section starts at uh, the old overheads uh, uh, page number uh, 106 at the upper uh, right of the overheads. And that's in um, PDF number 21 now, posted on the, the, uh, the website. So um, we're going to go through what PVI has on conjugate gradient applications. And first, we need to understand uh, and set some terms on inversion period. So um, Clarebout starts that out by examining what he calls univariate problems, which means problems uh, that are controlled by a single scalar unknown. And all we're trying to do is uh, determine the, the value of that single scalar. You'd think with a bunch of data that would be easy, right? But we're going to talk about lots of, um, lots of, the problem, lot, lots of problems that, that we can have with that. So um, even with these simple examples that Clarebout cooked up, um, we're going to uh, be able to illustrate these problems, uh, the problems in estimating or inverting for the, sim the single simple scalar unknown. Uh, and we're also going to uh, be able to illustrate some techniques for dealing with these problems. So this so-called crosstalk problem, which is really just mixing images, um, Clarebout solves with, um, with uh, a technique called weighting. Um, spectral division and deconvolution is a big problem in seismology, and uh, that uh, has a technique called damping to handle it. Uh, and then there's the problem of non-stationarity. In other words, uh, with the uh, properties, the statistical properties, the deterministic properties of the image or, or time series not staying the same as time or space change. Um, and that's solved with the uh, concept of moving windows. Now, first, we need to uh, basically make some definitions and kind of set up the math uh, that we will use to examine these. And so we're going to use the concept of a vector, which I, I write uh, uh, the vector uh, variable um, like this v here. And I put a, a little arrow on top of it, a little half arrow on top of it. That denotes an ordered list of data components. Uh, and each data component uh, will have uh, an index. So v sub i is one data component of that vector v. And uh, i, of course, uh, uh, coming from the C world, uh, I'm going to start i at 0. And it's going to go through some finite maximum big N. And it, of course, i is an integer. Um, so uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, very often, our components v sub i are each going to be scalars. So we could write out the whole vector as this ordered list here. And that's what the, uh, the, the parentheses uh, um, uh, suggest here. So uh, the vector v is equal to uh, the ordered list 1. And then the next element is 0. The next element is 2, for instance. And then that's an ellipsis here, three dots which means it can go on and on. And um, uh, on the other hand, uh, the components of vi, the components, each v sub i, they can be vectors themselves. So here's an example where the vector v is composed of components uh, uh, like this uh, ordered list itself. This vector is just the first, the whole vector is just the first component of v. And, uh, we could write this, you know, maybe this is uh, vector 1, this is vector 2 over here, this is vector 3. Uh, you know, we can denote these in, in various ways. Uh, and each of those vectors, you know, can have different components of its own. And in this case, each of these vectors has three components of, uh, and, and each of those components is a scalar number. In fact, it looks like each of the components is an integer. You can even put matrices, images, seismograms, um, common image gathers. You know, each component of the vector could be uh, a whole 3D data set. It could be a whole 4D study. 
Um, you know, so that's this is just a, a simple way of suggesting that uh, we could have a, a two by two matrix as each component, um, and those matrices themselves, uh, uh, their their components could be more complex, uh, et cetera, et cetera. For instance, if you have uh, images, you know, maybe each a vector of images, um, each uh, uh, component of the of the image vector of the vector of images is going to be an image. Maybe that's a uh, you know an eight uh, megapixel image, and each component of of the image vector is a color vector, which could be uh, um, ARGB. It could be uh, luminosity, uh, red, green, and blue um, integers. So um, uh, you know these can get quite complex. But notice that we've we've uh, left a certain kind of complexity. Uh, well, okay. Uh, one example that we have some experience with is a uh, a time series. Say this this time series X, which is a vector, um, and each of those um, uh, and uh, uh, so this is a uh, um, uh, a complex series. X is a complex series, and uh, uh, that's a the analytic trace, for instance. We've heard about analytic traces before, and each of the components of the uh, of the analytic trace, each of the time components, is a vector itself. Uh, that vector only has two um, floating point components, which we write here as a complex number, you know, say one plus zero i. But those are the two components of that complex number, right? The real value, the real part one, the imaginary part zero. Uh, and the next uh, component of the uh, of the time series could be zero plus one i, and and on and on. Okay, so the the complexity that we are going to take a miss with is um, at least in this in this class, all components of a given vector are going to have the same dimensionality, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, not if if we're going to set up a um, a vector where each component is a matrix. Uh, not only is each component going to be a two-dimensional two matrix, each component is going to be a two-by-two two-dimensional two matrix. Okay, uh, whatever order you call it. There's some terminology that mathematicians use that I can't remember right now. So, um, and, and so if we have a vector of images or a vector of complex numbers, you know they're uh, those images will all be the same size, okay, and they'll all have the same ordering of uh, ARGB, for instance. So, um, uh, why do we do that? Okay, uh, the reason that we we have um, all components of, of a given vector, and of course we'll you know we'll define other vectors that have different dimensionalities, but the reason that we want to um, um, it's just you know mathematical convenience and and not wanting to uh, have to write things on uh, our algebra on too many pages of, uh, of blank paper um, is that uh, um, it's very useful to define an inner product, uh, which you know, of course, is a dot product. And by write it, defining an inner product, we can then define for our vectors, uh, and it's it's easy and compact to do if they all you know if all components of a given vector have the same dimensionality, then it's easy for us to define that inner product for that vector type. And then that allows us to define for that vector type some kind of orthogonality, some perpendicularity. Okay, uh, So for instance, um, we have an x vector and a y vector. Uh, they have the, uh, uh, the same dimensionality. Each component is just a. Uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an integer in this case, and um, although it could be a, a, a just a scalar, um, and uh, you know uh, the first element is x one, the second element is x two, the third element is x three, and so we define a dot product which uh, is denoted by these angle brackets, and um, you know a, a less than and a greater than at the on the right side, and so uh, this. Uh, this notation means uh, dot product of or, or inner product of x and y, uh, which 
in this case, we can write as uh, what you know as a uh, dot product, x dot y. And that's x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2 plus x3 times y3. And doing that dot product, we get 1 times 0 plus 0 times 1 plus 0 times 0. And that gives us 0, which means that these two vectors, x and y, are orthogonal under this definition of the vector, this definition of the dot product. Okay, so this, uh, I'm sure, is review. Uh, but um, uh, we're going to extend this concept of orthog orthogonality to, uh, as you've already seen to some extent, you know, different definitions of dot products, like we did in defining um, migration as a, uh, a tomographic approximation of uh, of the uh, uh, of the inverse of the wave equation. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, utility in, in defining these uh, these dot products. So now beyond the geometric meaning, meaning we can take a you know very large data series. You know maybe this is a seismogram. Uh, X is a seismogram that uh, has a million elements. You know so X uh, equals uh, its components start at one, two, three, four, and so forth. And and then we can somehow find an orthogonal Y, which as far as I'm showing it here, let's say it's minus nine, one, 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 one. Um, and and uh, so uh, you know uh, often the problem is going to be how do we find that orthogonal y such that x dot y is equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit of, uh, of of mathematical setup there. Let's take a look at the crosstalk example. Um, so uh, uh, and and this is uh, uh, pure clear about here. You know the way he talks about it uh, in the in the book, and then the example pictures he shows, you know, are, are kind of a disconnect. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, we can we can work our way through that. Um, imagine uh, uh, seismic waves that are vertically incident on a two-component surface receiver. So we can uh, this this one geophone uh, has two different elements inside of it, two different sensors, and it records uh, one sensor records motion up and down, and the other sensor records motion uh, sideways, you know, left and right. And we have a P wave uh, that uh, this arrow here is suggesting that that P wave, P wave is vertically incident on that uh, receiver, and for a P wave, its particle motion is up and down. Uh, and then there's at the same time an S wave which is incident on that uh, same receiver. But it activates the side-to-side -side sensitive element uh, because the S waves, uh, you know, its propagation direction is is still straight up, but its particle motion is side to side, left to right. And we record from each sensor, we record a vector of data. So uh, ideally, in this case of vertical incidence, on the uh, the vertical time series v sub t. Um, you know, v for all t, we would see just a p wave. You know, whatever waveform uh, that p wave takes, p of t. And on the horizontal receiver, we would just see the s wave. And you can see I tried to make it look like an s wave, s of t. I tried to make it dispersive. Um, now suppose that uh, instead of being vertical, the incidence is slightly off vertical. Okay, maybe just I think I this looks like 15 degrees here. All right, if that's slightly. Now that means that the uh, the particle motions are rotated as well. The P wave's particle motion, when it hits the uh, the receiver, is no longer straight up and down. It's you know 15 degrees off vertical, and the S wave's particle motion is no longer horizontal but 15 degrees off horizontal. Each component records some then of each wave type. So on the uh, on the on the vertical recording, the vertical Component recording, we have p of t, okay, uh, a lot of that, but then we get some of s of t, okay, crosstalk between the components. On the horizontal recording, h of t, we get a little bit of p of t, and uh, we still get most of s of t. Uh, and so we can write down this simple and and not quite physical, but still uh, hopefully useful representation of this crosstalk. 
you know, so we have uh, v is equal to, uh, and these are these are time series now, uh, um, but remember these are generalized data vectors as well. So uh, uh, maybe uh, maybe these are uh, uh, um, maybe each vector is a, is an image of uh, uh, still scalar, scalar uh, components, but uh, um, uh, scalar components, but uh, um, uh, you know, it's got a, a two-dimensional ordering in the in the image. All right, so v is equal to uh, to the the p wave plus some uh, scale factor alpha times the s wave plus noise, of course, and the horizontal recording uh, is uh, the s wave plus uh, uh, some alpha prime, you know, some other scale factor. Uh, times the P wave, you know, and, and both alpha and alpha prime should be much less than zero, right? Uh, uh, plus uh, uh, some horizontal noise, you know, n prime. Okay, and and you know, for the whole seismogram, right? Alpha and alpha prime are constants. They're both scalars. They're uh, they're constants, and actually, even as scalars, they're filter operators. So of, of course, you know that filters can be much more complex. Than just scalars, but scalars are still uh, still filters as well. Our univariate problem is to estimate alpha given v and h data, given the recorded data. Okay, and what we would like to do then is estimate the amount of crosstalk. Now, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, lots of ways proposed in the last uh, twenty years to uh, you know, separate P and S waves, um, and that's best um, done using not only um, um, uh, not only multi-component receivers, but also using uh, arrays of these multi-component receivers. Uh, so we do have uh, even you know we have geothermal seismic data sets uh, which which have that. Um, you know, such as the Santa Medio data. You know, it's an array of multi-component receivers. So, uh, you know, there are there are very standard ways now of uh, separating P from S. Uh, we're just going to write down a, an initial guess. Okay, um, we're going to guess, uh, uh, and this seems out of the blue now, that the P wave is estimated by V minus alpha H, and the S wave is estimated by H minus alpha prime V. Okay, now how did we guess that? Well, look at uh, V and H, right? V is is in this in this uh, approximation here. Um, you know, it really should be what one minus uh, alpha that quantity times P, but we just left it as P plus alpha S, right? So, so what we did is we just said, all right, we start with uh, uh, with V. So uh, p is equal to v minus alpha s, and we're ignoring the noise. Okay. So um, p is equal to v minus uh, 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 alpha h, right? Because uh, h is uh, s here is mostly is most of what's in h. So uh, you know a guess. Okay. Uh, likewise, s is equal to h minus alpha prime v. Now. Um, if you're not used to guessing uh, um, these kinds of solutions, we are going to, uh, I think, in this class, get to uh, discussing conjugate operators. And after I've discussed that some, I think it'll become immediately apparent uh, how you can make this guess and how you can make it very easily and very reliably, um, given any such simple setup. So what this, is, uh, what this guess is suggesting, then, is that if we can estimate alpha somehow, if we can invert for alpha, take the data and invert for alpha, then we can find p and we can eliminate the crosstalk. Okay, right? If we if we achieve this solution of uh, of isolating p, then we we can eliminate the crosstalk and uh, just be able to look at the p wave. Which you know, let's say if we're doing p wave migration, uh, that's what we want to do. All right. So Clairbout's uh, strategy, um, since uh, v is equal to p plus the crosstalk, uh, we seek alpha such that uh, p is equal to v minus alpha h. Okay, 
and where that has minimum energy. All right, we're trying to set up an inversion problem here. So, so um, you know, we have uh, um, we our our strategy here at first is to find alpha such that uh, the resulting p that we're estimating is as small as possible. Okay, so uh, that's our that's our initial strategy. Um, so energy is uh, is p dot p. Okay, that's just p squared, and uh, and here's uh, we're writing it out in terms of the uh, uh, the definition of p that we've made here. So that's uh, v minus alpha h dotted with v minus alpha h, uh, and this uh, this uh, this energy minimum occurs where the uh, uh, the derivative of energy with respect to alpha is equal to zero. Right. So here's an alpha scale. And uh, we could run run along the scale of alpha, and we could calculate uh, p, and we could take p dot p and calculate the energy, and uh, we would find some sort of curve. Well, we don't know yet. Uh, we're going to assume that it's a curve, that it's at least that it's continuous. In fact, it's got to be better than piecewise continuous for this to work. It's got to be a continuous curve. It's got to be. Um, uh, single single valued. You can't get two different energies at the same uh, alpha. Okay, so that's a qualifi another qualification there. Um, it depends on the data because uh, remember there's that noise in there that we're not accounting for. If if uh, remember we're we're you know we're not taking p is equal to v minus alpha s okay so we don't have s we're taking uh, you know uh, one piece of the data minus another piece of the data so so there's going to be a minimum okay so let's 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 crank that through okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. This, this, you know, this idea of minimizing the energy that you that you get out, you know, I mean, one reason that you 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 want to eliminate the crosstalk is you want to see the strong P waves. But now in our in our uh, inversion, we're going to require that the P waves be weak. We're going to find the place where they're weakest. Okay, that's just a first attempt. Let's see what happens. Okay. So p dot p is uh, v dot v minus two alpha times v dot h plus alpha squared uh, times uh, h dot h, right? So we can solve that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we can differentiate it. So b d p dot p d alpha is equal to minus two v dot h plus two alpha h dot h is equal to zero, <coughs> and we solve that for uh, alpha, and we get uh, alpha is equal to v dot h divided by h dot h, okay, and um, we can also find um, uh, uh, using the same process we can find alpha prime, okay, which uh, is only is only slightly different. It's v dot h, same as with alpha, but now divided by v dot v. Um, remember, these dot products produce just scalars, right? So this is just dividing one scalar by another. And getting our single scalar objective, which is alpha, and really uh, alpha prime is just another version of it. Um, so by minim minimizing the energy, then p should be orthogonal to h, okay? Um, because uh, uh, because of the way we uh, we had it set up here. So if we're minimizing uh, p. The energy of p, then v should be orthogonal to h. I'm sorry, p should be orthogonal to h. Um, so uh, p dot h is uh, equal to v minus alpha h uh, dot, and all of that dotted by h, and then we have uh, v dot h minus alpha h dot h, and uh, v dot h minus v dot h over h dot h times h dot h, and you work all that through, and you just get zero. Okay, uh, what this shows is that uh, our objective function is well behaved. There are no local minima. 
Okay, so that's uh, that's useful to know. Uh, another way of justifying this uh, this approach, which I, I agree does seem way too simple. Okay, now. Um, uh, of course, the trouble is, and Clairbout shows this with a with a simple, although not you know for uh, for earthquake seismologists, it's not at all an obvious example uh, because it's an image, not a seismogram. Uh, this this uh, figure four point one in the PVI book, uh, Clairbout shows that this method works poorly. Okay, what that means is that uh, in our data, P and S are not orthogonal. Our sample of P and S is too short, okay, um, and so it violates all the whole setup of the problem. So here's the uh, the image data, and I'm sorry for the poor copy. I should have pulled out the uh, digital figure from the um, from the book from the electronic book, uh, but I advise you to go look at it yourself. You see a uh, uh, the, the H recording is this image on top. The V recording is this is this image on the bottom. Um, so uh, you know we're not looking at seismograms. We're looking at uh, a picture, uh, and and we're not. It's not a color picture. It's a black and white picture. So it's just a uh, in lumosity that we're uh, looking at. And you can see a little bit of crosstalk. At least I can see on the screen. You know, there's the uh, the E right there. There's the E crosstalked from the uh, the V recording. The V recording is mostly pressure wave, okay, and um, and you can see on the V recording you can see a little bit. There's a little bit of the S. Sorry, it's uh, so dim on the screen. Um, and uh, um, and what do you get when you minimize P dot P? Um, well, let's compare. Okay, here the the image is uh, white, of the uh, uh, you know there's a gray background which represents zero, um, uh, you know zero on the seismograms as they were, and so white means a negative value, and how has it uh, gotten rid of the pressure wave? How's it minimized p dot p? Okay, it's uh, it's taken um, uh, uh, let's see. Scroll back here. You can see that image of shear crosstalked is the S is white, so it's negative. So what is our uh, what is our uh, uh, our minimization done? It's given us an alpha that uh, puts in a strong negative image of the crosstalk, so it appears just as badly crosstalked. Okay, and. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, maybe this would work if we had an absolute luminosity image, uh, but for seismograms it doesn't work. Okay, uh, minimizing the energy is not uh, not the way to go. Clearly, um, you can see uh, where there's overlap. You know, the the plus is canceling out with the uh, the minus, and so it's actually enforce it's actually reinforcing the crosstalk to cancel as much of the uh, of the energy. As it can. Okay, so we'll we'll get to the other parts of this uh, uh, later on. Um, so, of course, minimizing p dot p, the energy of the in inverted uh, uh, image or seismogram, doesn't work. By finding alpha to uh, minimize p dot p, we added a uh, a negative s, so p would be canceled where it overlaps s. Okay. We effectively assume that P and S are orthogonal, and you know, in finite data, that uh, that rarely occurs. So um, um, that's how uh, that's that's how it didn't work. Okay. All right. So so uh, the workaround here, which I'm sure you've seen in lots of, of papers, is some kind of weighting function. As we minimize P dot P, all right. Let's consider the strong areas of the vertical recording less, and the quiet areas more. All right. So, you know, going up here, you know, we want to we want to emphasize what's going on in the quiet areas here. Okay, and de-emphasize what's going on in the overlap areas, like where shear the shear crosstalk overlaps uh, 
pressure. Uh, you know, and you just have to sort of, uh, clear about leaves you to sort of imagine what real seismograms would look like. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is uh, redo our objective function such that uh, uh, our, our um, instead of just our objective being to minimize p dot p, we're going to minimize this f, f of alpha. An objective function has to be a function of, of the, uh, the model parameter, which here is just alpha. Okay, and it's going to be the sum over all time, uh, or the whole image, of a weight, uh, a, a time-based weight, w sub i, times, uh, um, and this is uh, the the estimate of p, v sub i minus uh, alpha h sub i, and take the square of that. So we're weighting the energy of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, what should be the p energy, okay? Um, so clearly, previously, we used a weighting function of one. Every w sub i was one. Now we're going to use uh, this weighting function, okay? So um, the weighting function is going to be one over v sub i squared plus some uh, sigma, okay? And this is for finding uh, sigma squared uh, for finding alpha. So the larger v sub i is, the less of, of the p dot p uh, is going to contribute to the objective function. So for finding alpha prime, then uh, we use a weight, w sub i, that is equal to 1 over h sub i squared plus sigma squared. This weighting is minimizing the sum of the relative errors. OK. So uh, uh, let's see. Um, and that's the, uh, there's the data again. And here's the, the, the inversion with a uh, weighting by data uh, just once. And it's, uh, it's a bit better than the, uh, than the data. But you can still see some crosstalk, okay? Um, and so finally, when we get to a uh, a further iteration here, you know, there's uh, no crosstalk that I can see on this. Sorry, bad copy. Uh, okay, so how are we how are we iterating then? Now suppose I already had an estimate of alpha, okay? And that estimate of alpha is uh, you know using the weights. What's producing this uh, this image right here? Okay, so um, I've got that estimate of alpha, and um, <clears throat> you know I got that from a uh, let's call that estimate alpha one. <clears throat> now I'm going to write an objective function that weights errors relative to a previous estimate. Okay, so we're going to minimize alpha two. Okay, that's going to be the next objective function. Uh, we're going to minimize this function of, of alpha 2. And um, we're going to take the sum of uh, uh, v sub i minus alpha 2 times h sub i squared. And this is going to be divided by uh, first the quantity v sub i minus alpha 1 h sub i squared, right? So that's the, you know, the, the energy from the uh, previous alpha. And here's the one we're minimizing, you know, alpha two, uh, and we got to add uh, we got to add uh, plus uh, uh, sigma squared there. Uh, and then we iterate with the new estimate uh, alpha two um, becoming uh, the old estimate alpha one in the next try. Okay, and we continue trying until you know alpha two is not distinguishably different from alpha 1, at least in absolute value. Uh, and so the way that's written here is that the absolute value of the quantity alpha one mi alpha 2 minus alpha 1 is less than some epsilon. And, and uh, so we continue iterating until uh, uh, we have what we call convergence, where uh, our, our uh, 
you know, our new values are, are not different enough from our old value to make any difference. OK, and, and your immediate questions, I'm sure, are, will it converge? It's a very problematic question. I can't answer it. Depends on the data. It can be extremely slow. It may never converge. Uh, will it, uh, you know, and, and, and we're just trying to answer the question, you know, we're not even trying to get it to converge to zero difference. We're just trying to get it to converge to some, to some epsilon, OK? Um, you know, some epsilon that's uh, less than 100%. Um, and, uh, and we don't know that yet. Uh, the, another big question is, will it converge to the right answer? OK, that's also problematic. Um, if, uh, if alpha is uh, greater than 1, the solution of, uh, of, uh, uh, of v converges to, uh, to s. So uh, you know, in, in, this, in what we just set up, um, you know, we, can, uh, we could even uh, make it converge to the wrong answer. Okay. Um, so um, that's, uh, uh, that's another problem. OK, with, uh, uh, now we have this uh, weighting function is, uh, is equal to 1 over the data squared, the, in here the vertical data squared, v sub i um, squared. Okay. Now there are plenty of places in the, in the data where, where v sub i squared would be 0. So that's why we add this sigma squared. Sigma squared we call a water level. Uh, and I'm not showing it. Uh, uh, Exactly uh, here, um, you know. Really, it's taking the whole curve of, of v sub i, uh, v versus i, and uh, lifting it all up off the uh, off zero, um, a v squared. Okay. Um, uh, clearly, we've got to avoid getting zero values in that denominator to uh, avoid infinite weights. All right. So. Uh, and, and you can recast it as, a, as an if statement. It's just easier to write it uh, uh, like this. That really would be a water level where if uh, v sub i squared falls below uh, sigma squared, then you, you substitute sigma squared for, uh, for, for uh, v sub i squared. That's harder to write in the math, so, uh, uh, so we express it this way. But this is really what I have in mind. And that's, e that's actually not any problem to implement in a in a computer code. How do you choose uh, uh, sigma? Okay. Now we're finally going to consider the noise. Okay. Sigma should be related to a noise level, below which we believe the values of the vertical v sub i data, or, and also uh, you know, there's another noise level for the h sub i uh, data, where those values are not significant. Okay. There are some possibilities. We could select. Sigma from the mean. Sigma is some percentage of the mean of the components of v, right? So you could select it this way. Um, you know, for uh, uh, if you think your data are are really clean, then you might uh, you might put in a, a p value here of 1%, 0 0.01, and uh, you'll get a sigma that's uh, you know 1% of the mean. If you have really noisy data, it might be much more effective to Select a uh, to use a p of of 0.5, so you're going to select a sigma that's you know 50 percent of the mean. Okay. Uh, you can select uh, sigma from the median. Uh, sigma is the value at some percentile of the ordered components of v. Okay. So for clean data, you might use the tenth percentile uh, for seismograms. For noisy data. Uh, you might use the 50th percentile, which would be the median, or even more. Okay. Uh, you don't want to use 100%. Um, that would be really useless data. Um, what is the effect of, of noise? Okay. So we had uh, our V recording is equal to P plus alpha S plus N. Our horizontal recording H is equal to S plus alpha prime p plus n prime. Now uh, suppose that we have noisy data, 
so both the magnitude of n over divided by the vertical data and the magnitude of, of n prime divided by the magnitude of the horizontal data, they're both large. They're both greater than 1. The signal uh, over noise ratio is, is less than 1. Okay. Um, and, and supposing that, then our guessed solution really looks like this. P is equal to noise minus alpha n prime. Okay, S is equal to n prime minus alpha prime n. And what we're minimizing okay, is uh, P dot P, you know, what we first started minimizing was the, uh, the magnitude, is uh, n minus alpha n prime dot n minus alpha n prime. Okay, if uh, if n and n prime are uncorrelated and of infinite size, okay, so we got billions and billions of, of elements in that in those seismograms, and there's no you know mechanical uh, or elect electrical connection between those two uh, the horizontal and vertical elements uh, that are generating the noise. They're being done at different amplifiers. Uh, and they're both completely insulated from, uh, you know, ele electrical spikes in the outside world. Um, so if n and n prime, n prime are uncorrelated, which, we, you know, we like to think of, we like to think of of our uh, um, of our noise as totally uncorrelated noise. You know, no, uh, um, you know, purely random uh, Gaussian noise, for instance. Okay, uh, then what you'll get, and if you have enough of it, n dot n prime is going to be equal to zero, and then what we're going to find then is alpha is going to be n dot n prime divided by n dot n, and of course that's just going to produce zero. All right. Now with uh, with a finite, and I don't care if you have a billion samples, is still finite. Um, and as we as we saw in 706, n and n prime are finite. Then n dot n prime has random polarity. Okay, and um, and we're going to get then we're going to get the absolute value. Of, you know, whatever alpha we get, it's going to be small and um, uh, in, in absolute value. Okay, so if we have too much noise. This is what happens, right? If we got large noise, signal to noise ratio is below one, okay, uh, then we can't estimate a useful alpha using this procedure. So um, we've got to have a way of removing the noise. If we believe the noise and, and signal spectra, uh, for instance, don't overlap entirely, okay. Then we might try estimating alpha from, from you know time filtered versions of V and H, okay. Which this is what seismologists do every day. Um, you know they try to find a filter that uh, uh, takes the uh, the noise down to a reasonable level. All right, and being exploration seismologists and being able to uh, uh, have arrays of of data recordings. We can use spatial filters as well, and and really the um, you know operations like uh, the the coherency. What's that called again? That you were uh, similarity. The similarity. Those are all spatial filters, you know, meant to get rid of noise. Okay, so uh, you know this this opens up a whole realm of processing that we need before we can even attempt inversion. And you look at every paper on inversion, and they've got some way of um, of estimating uh, of of filter, trying to filter out noise, no matter what they've got. All right. Looks like I have some time to introduce deconvolution. Okay. Um, there are uh, a couple of objectives. For deconvolution in the exploration world, um, there are. Uh, let me just mention some of the um, uh, objectives of deconvolution in the uh, in the earthquake seismology world. Um, 
Uh, it would be identification of uh, source time functions and rupture history. Um, it would be uh, identification of site effects and uh, site resonances. Um, uh, another would be uh, uh, identification of, uh, of crustal and mantle discontinuities, um, uh, or even uh, uh, just for picking uh, phases. You might need to do deconvolution just to get uh, uh, reliable P and S arrival time picks and locate earthquakes. Um, uh, source uh, uh, um, source parameter inversion, uh, getting getting um, um, getting uh, um, uh, moment tensors, estimates of moment tensors, uh, and a big new one is um, uh, essentially. Uh, 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 the, uh, the deconvolutions that are inherent in uh, full wave uh, inversion, okay, and that's one place where uh, the uh, the earthquake seismologists and the uh, uh, the exploration seismologists are have kind of come together a bit in their uh, um, in their techniques. Okay, some simple exploration objectives for deconvolution. Uh, Number one is uh, source compression. You know, maybe our vibrator was sitting on a on a soft sandy uh, spot, and uh, the signal coming out of the vibrator, even after um, even after uh, 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 sweep uh, cross correlation, is uh, very long and very complex. Uh, you know, it's got a long uh, time uh, uh, duration, or as, and I, I might uh, I might be better off saying lambda t. Okay, and we just want to increase the depth resolution, uh, the spatial resolution. So we need a more com compact um, wavelet, uh, and we can achieve that by deconvolution under the right conditions. We want a short lambda t, a short duration wavelet. Okay, that'll identify our uh, our reflectors much more specifically. Um, in PVI um, on page eighty eight at least the printed book, uh, look at figure 4.5. Um, OK, multiple suppression is another, is another good uh, objective for deconvolution. Uh, you might have uh, shallow marine reflection surveys over hard bottoms. OK, um, and a, a, a real great example is when they did uh, uh, marine surveys. They were doing deep crustal work, actually. Um, and they were doing marine surveys uh, in the fjords of uh, western British Columbia and uh, southeastern Alaska, and those have been scraped clear in uh, you know just ten thousand years ago. Those were scraped clean of any sediment or mud, and so you basically have polished granite at the bottom of your water column. Um, and uh, not only did that cause uh, uh, you know lots of energy to rattle between the surface and the bottom. Um, and that completely destroyed uh, the P wave images of the deep crust they were trying to get. Uh, it also had the amazing effect of, of, of uh, converting S waves from the uh, marine source signal and sending those S waves deep into the mantle. And, uh, and they reflected off uh, boundaries in the mantle you know, even 200 kilometers down, and came up to their uh, receiver arrays. Um, so they they ex they were trying for a uh, um, uh, a P wave reflection survey of of uh, places like the Portland Canal, um, you know, in southeastern most Alaska, and they uh, uh, you know where where you can actually get to like more than halfway uh, across the uh, Across the Cordillera in the water, which is pretty amazing, um, and uh, uh, they uh, uh, what they got was an uh, they got they got basically zero P wave results, at least so far as I remember seeing, and uh, 
and they got amazing, stunning S-wave results. Um, so, uh, uh, and of course, they, they tried every multiple suppression uh, scheme that they could find on the uh, P-wave results. Um, so deconvolution applications, all, you know, more of them even appear as we uh, consider several types of uh, inversions. Uh, indeed, the concept of deconvolution comes out, and, and think back to the very beginning of uh, 706, from the filter model, the physical model as I called it then, where we have uh, uh, for exploration an earth reflectivity, not an earthquake source here. So we have earth reflectivity series x uh, sub t, and we have a source wavelet that gets convolved with the source wavelet f sub t, and uh, then we add some noise, and uh, then we get the data y sub t. In time, uh, the data y sub t is equal to the source wavelet f sub t convolved. That's what that messy star there is supposed to be. Convolved with uh, uh, x sub t, the uh, earth reflectivity, and then with some noise added. In frequency, as you know, um, we have the, uh, uh, the Fourier transform of the data, y of omega. Capital y of omega is equal to the Fourier transform of the Earth re reflectivity series, f of omega, uh, multiplied by capital X of, of omega, the Fourier transform of the source wavelet, plus the Fourier transform of the noise, which, as you remember from, the, uh, uh, from 706, the Fourier transform of the noise looks just like the noise. Okay. All right. I better stop there. Let the next class come in.